Well, if you have your Bibles, open the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, the very first one. If it's not the first book in your Bible, then most likely it's either not the Bible or you uh, lost it some way on the way to church. I had a Bible like that once with a spine broken, some pages fell out of it. You don't know what you lost, so you'll start looking for Philippians, and it's not there any longer. So Genesis should be the first one in the Old Testament right there, Genesis. And uh, glad you're here at church today. I'm boy, excited for what God has for us. And I have some great to have some visitors here this morning. I feel bad. we got a young couple here on their honeymoon. Amen. Coming to church on their honeymoon. Amen. So either you don't want to go to church or you don't want to be on a honeymoon. Both are good options, all right? If you're not married, you ought to be married. And if you are married, life's a honeymoon, right? I'm at 14 years in my honeymoon. <clears throat> and... Uh, but they're here, and I feel badly because Pastor Alette preached at the camp that he worked at all summer, and he came to hear Pastor Alette, and he got stuck with me. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> yeah, he knows. Poor guy. No, we're glad everyone's here, though. Guys, some couples here, and Dante Beg came this morning, came to Sunday school, so we're glad they're here. And a couple here from uh, just moved up this area in Birch Run, and the Allen's glad you guys are here today. And in Genesis chapter number 6, though, I want to preach on this morning on the flood. All right, you can't go to church very long as a young person in Sunday school and not hear a story about Noah and the flood. Can you? I mean, you go to Sunday school, and, and if you're at First Baptist Church, and uh, you got called last night to teach a Sunday school class for young people, you're going to go through your list of stories for, for this class. In your mind, you'll think, well, I can teach David and Goliath, but I taught that last week. All right, teach about Jonah, and that'll come up next week, just so you know. And uh, then you, eventually you're going to come to Noah. Like, I can teach about Noah because everyone knows about Noah and the flood. And you can talk in class about how Noah built a big ark and all the animals came in there and they were there for 40 days and 40 nights. You can have your, your kids sound out a storm and some people will move their hands and some people will laugh their legs and you can make it like a storm sound in Sunday school. But it seems like everyone knows about the flood. Now, some people resist the idea of the flood. If you look up the flood online, don't do it now, please, because you hopefully have your Bibles open. But if you were to Google the flood, you'll find articles about why the flood was just a myth, why the flood could never have happened. There's no way that water covered the whole earth. You look about the flood and you see there are songs about the flood. We sing songs at church about Noah, this guy who got, out, got on a big boat full of smelly animals for a long time, eventually got off the boat, and, and uh, there, there's jokes about Noah. I imagine back in those days when Noah was alive that they didn't have blonde jokes, they had Noah jokes. Now, I know the blonde jokes, and I, won't, I will spare you the blonde, but I mean, I've got some funny blonde jokes. But blonde jokes are no longer politically correct, you realize that, right? It is no longer politically correct to make fun of anybody or anything. Unless of someone who believes something, then you can make fun of them. But we have blonde jokes, and there used to be Polish jokes, and I'm Puerto Rican, so there's Puerto Rican jokes. Listen, I've heard your Puerto Rican jokes. They're not funny. Okay, they're not funny. Blonde jokes are funny. All right, Puerto Rican jokes are not funny. But I guarantee that Noah jokes were funny. I bet Noah, when he's out there building this ark, was a local attraction. Hey, what are you doing your lunch break? I'm going to go see Noah build that ark, dude. That'd be great, hammering away at this thing. He's been doing it for years. Oh, crazy Noah. But then one day the water came. One day the ground was a little damp. One day water filled up to the step, to the window, over the roof. There's a lot of questions that surround the account of the flood. Questions like, well, could Noah have really fit all these animals in the ark? In Williamston, Kentucky, there is now what they call the Ark Encounter. They built a life-size replica of the ark itself. Inside there, you'll find, you'll find uh, examples, you'll find illustrations, you'll find robotic animals, and they show how, how the animals fit inside the ark and what it would have been like to be inside that ark. cost them over $100 million to build this Ark Encounter in Kentucky. They had a little over, I think, a million visitors last year. And they said, well, that's well, the, the secular people have said, well, that's well under speculations. They should have been at two million. And they fired back and said, well, you don't know how many people under the age of five have come because we don't sell tickets. Five and under are free. 
and they will not release their total numbers, but they said, we are doing just fine. There are questions about the, about the flood, a question like this. Well, you claim, and they usually say you as Christians, you claim that God is love, so how could such a loving God destroy the whole earth? Have you heard that question before? They'll really much phrase it after any natural disaster. A tsunami comes, and well, where was God in this tsunami? Where was God in this school shooting? And, and where was God with this earthquake? And where was God here? And, and it seems like a, a barb they try to throw out at people who believe in God that if God was really in charge and in control, then, then nothing bad would ever happen. And if something does happen that's bad, then obviously God has lost control. And I think the flood teaches us a, a, some wonderful lessons. The truth is sometimes in our life, we feel like it's the flood. Have you ever felt like when it rains, it pours? And I'm not talking about blessings. I'm talking about hard times. Have you ever felt like it just seems like the way we, we interpret life as humans, that when one bad thing happens that we deem as bad, that another one follows, another one follows, we're like, oh, trouble comes in threes. Right? I'm waiting for the third one. I'm waiting for the shoe, other shoe to drop. We're pretty much naturally pessimistic people, are we not? We're like, oh, it's a flood, and I know God promised never to destroy the world, but he's destroying my life right now. Well, does God really care? Has God forgotten about us? I want to, this morning, this evening, look at the account of the flood. I titled my sermon, Where is God? It feels like the flood. I wonder if there's someone here today, or a couple here today, or a family here today who feels or believes that they're in the middle of the flood. And in Genesis chapter 6, we have not the story of the flood, but the account of the flood. You see, there's a lot of books with stories in them that are fiction and made up. This is not a made up fiction. This is an account of the flood. This is not fiction. It's history. This is what happened. And we know that because God said it to be true. We know it because there are evidences for the flood. And if you would look in Genesis chapter 6, Starting in verse number 1, we read just a few verses to begin with. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the earth, on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said in verse number 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also his flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years." Now let me pause real quick. Some right there will say that God then put a time limit, 120 years from them till when the flood came. Others will say, no, that became the time that God gave man to live for a while and then he eventually knocked it down to 70 years. I'll give you the best answer that I have. I have no idea. We don't know that it was 120 years to the flood, though some will argue that. We know that some people lived 120 years after the flood. What we do know is this, that God said... Um, his day shall be 120 years. That's what we know. And then eventually it stopped. Right? Because sometimes in the Bible, there's not great answers. But we trust it and keep on believing. Verse number four. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. And they bare children to them. The, son, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Verse number five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord." Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this portion of scripture. Lord, I thank you that you, with this passage, have tried to impart some truth to us. I pray that our hearts would be open, that you would help me to say those things that are true and honest about this portion of scripture. Lord, help our hearts to be turned towards you. Would you touch us and change us? In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I look at this passage and I see some things that, that uh, I think will be helpful to us this morning. The first thing I see in this passage is I see God's monitoring. Verses 1 through 6, I see some observations of the Lord. I see the regard of the Lord. The Bible says in verse 5 and later on in verse 12 that God saw and that God looked. 
You say, well, Brother Howell, why is that important? Because we are apt to think that God really doesn't care. Not because we don't know that to be true. We know what the Bible says. We know what the Bible teaches us. We know what God says. But there are those little thoughts in our mind that says, you know what? God wasn't watching when that happened. For righteousness or for sin. That God wasn't really paying attention when you broke down on the side of the road at midnight. Where was God in that? You see, the same questions that other people will ask, where is God in this calamity? Those same questions the devil or our flesh or our heart will put into our mind. We'll say, well, was God really there? Was he really paying attention? Because why, if he was, do you have this bill? Why do you have this diagnosis? Why did this person pass? And so I look here and I see that the regard. I see that God looked and God saw. Verse number five, the Bible said God saw that the wickedness of man. It wasn't just a passing glance. That word saw looks, it gives the idea of an observation. It's kind of like with my kids, they're playing outside, and I look out the window, and I see them playing. I could walk away from the window, but upon further observation, I see that what they're doing is not what I want to have happen in life. The other day, they were playing, and my younger two were playing, Danielle and James, and they begin to argue a little bit while they were playing outside. And so I saw them with a passing glance, but then I saw them, and I observed them. And I heard their tone of voice, and I watched their actions, and I saw they were arguing. And so then, because I had saw what happened, I became involved. And I acted upon what I saw. Well, I see that God regarded what happened, but then I also see the response. In verse number 6, the Bible gives us two words that I think are powerful. The first word is this, it repented the Lord. It repented the Lord. That word repented, it means he sighed his spirit. <sighs> Sometimes we see that word repented in scripture and we say, aha, you see God changed his mind. But I thought God could never change. I caught the Bible in a trick. The Bible does not say that God changed his mind, but to say that it, what the Bible is saying is that God looked upon the earth and he saw the wickedness of man, it was great. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And it's like God was up in heaven and he just like, Man, what a mess. What a mess. Now, I know the Lord did not do this because he knows everything, but can you imagine the Lord in it for a moment looking at this and sighing and saying, you know, Gabriel, Michael the archangel, created him and put him in the garden. He made a mess there. Kicked him out of the garden and I provided another way for them and they're making a mess again. Then the Bible uses this word in it, grieved him. Now, when you think of the flood, do you think of, and help me here, God's wrath or God's grieving? What do you think of typically when you think of the flood? God's wrath, right? You think of the flood, well, God was angry and boom, he just wiped it out. Man, he just mopped up this earth without water and he was done with them. It intrigued me that the first thing in the passage is God was repented in his heart. He was, he was sorrowful in his heart. And then he was grieved was heavy. Years ago, I was riding to camp, school camp, and I was riding in the car with Bill Swain. Bill Swain was on our staff here for 29 years as principal. We're sitting in the car just talking about life, and he made this statement to me. He said, J.D., when you have kids one day, and I don't think I was even married at that point, still in my thousand-day plan for those of you who remember that, all right, uh, he said, when you have kids one day, he goes, make sure you let them see your grief, not just your anger. He said, too many parents are, are quick to show the kids the anger, the, a, a, but not the grief. And, and what's happened? That phrase has stuck with me, and when I began to study this passage, and I saw that verse, and I saw that word, and I saw what happened, what it means, that that, that is what God did. He grieved. Boy, you see it at Walmart. You see a little kid just throwing a tantrum because they want the Snickers bar. And what do you see a parent? Well, they're grieved, all right, but they're not grieved. Sorry, they're grieved in anger. You sit up right now. Oh, you're not getting one, not getting one. And they're looking around to see who's watching, right? Eventually, they usually they buy the Snickers bar. Or you see someone reacting. Maybe you as a parent have done that. You've seen your child misbehave, and the grief didn't come through, but the anger came through. That's it. Oh! Yet I don't see that from God right here. 
Oh, I see some wrath later on. I see judgment later on, but it's wrapped in his grieving. I wonder if I was in your home and I asked your kids or asked your spouse or asked your coworkers at work, listen, if something upsets this person, upsets you, what is their response? Are they grieved? Or are they just angry? I wonder what they, what they would tell me about you. I wonder what your kids would say. Oh, yeah, my daddy, he, he grieves, he's sad. It was in college that I was listening to a man, he talked about raising his kids, and he said, he said when you have kids, make sure you, you turn them back to Jesus. How did this disappoint the Lord? He talked about an illustration where his two kids were fighting. They were young, maybe two and four years old, I think he said this. And he said after they got done fighting, he sat them down and said, listen, how did that please Jesus? And they just say, no, it didn't please Jesus. You see, too often we say, listen, you displeased daddy, you displeased mommy, you embarrassed me, you embarrassed your mother, you embarrassed our family, now judgment will come. In this passage, I see that the Lord, it repented him because the wickedness was so great, but I see his, his grief. Being in the school the last 14 years, I've had to deal with problems sometimes. Sometimes it's a student that made a bad choice and every once in a while we have one that makes a bad choice. Not too often. We're very blessed. But I can remember a handful of times when a student made a bad choice and I would say the parent came in and made the worst choice by their reaction. I've been cussed at in my office. That's not grief now, is it? It's not grief. And I look at this passage and I see that God, it grieved. He was vexed in his heart by what he saw. Too often we become irritated or, or we become angry by what we see. I wonder if you'd say, listen, I get grieved when I see a marriage fall apart. It should grieve our heart. When God's name is maligned, it should grieve our heart. When someone, a Christian, makes a wrong choice, it should grieve our heart. We should be known by our grief, not by our anger. And the Bible says it repented the Lord and it grieved him at his heart. It vexed him in his very essence. But then I see the reason. The Bible says that the reason was that the wickedness of man was great. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Boy, I wonder here if we'd say the world is wicked again. What does it take? What do you think it takes for the world to be this wicked? You ever thought about what the world was like that God would destroy it? How bad would it have to be for God to look down and say, boy, this world is terrible? Will they have to approve gay marriage? Would they have to kick God out of every public sector, any occasion, any appearance, any reference to God? Would that have to be kicked out for every imagination would to be only evil continually? Would it have to be that only things that really matter are the, the things that are anti-God, that you can have any thoughts you want if you don't believe in God, but if, you, but if you believe in God, then your thoughts are not welcome. And the Bible says in verse number 5 that the wickedness of man was great and that every imagination and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I'll tell you what, I've known some people who have been wicked. I've known some people who I would wonder if they'd fall into this category. But I, I see this and I, and I see God's just greatness of his mercy in this. You say, his mercy. Because remember, this precedes his repentance. It precedes his, his grieving. When I see this, I see a few things about the wickedness. I see, first of all, that the imaginations were evil. The earth was corrupt, verse 11 and 12. And we live, if we can say this, we live in a corrupt society. We turn on the TV and the, this world is corrupt. We are often... Uh, muting or turning off things and hopefully if you watch things on TV you have some way to filter it there are great ways to filter things you don't have to watch TV there are preachers that will go up here and say you should never have a TV and I'm fine if they believe that there's preachers that will come and smash a TV with an axe alright now that just sounds cool 
All right? It sounds amazing to bring a, a TV and just smash it with an axe. And if you want to bring one, we'll smash it with an axe and a chainsaw. We'll run it over, man. This will be great. And they'll say, you should never watch TV. And that's fine. I think we'd be far better the less TV we watch. Oh, thank you, Brother Barry. Let me say that again. We'd be far better the less TV we watch. Because I turn on that TV, I don't see a lot that supports what I'm trying to teach my kids. I, can, I don't turn too many stations where I'm like, wow, that's the Bible station. That's great. Now, there is a Christian station on TV, but I wouldn't call that the Bible station. If you've ever watched a Christian station, you'd be hard-pressed to find the Bible on the Christian station. All right, but you'll find it more on that station than you will on Fox News or Fox TV, will you not? There's a lot on there, and, and uh, we could watch TV. We could say about TV that pretty much every imagination of the heart was only, is only evil continually on TV. They're trying to sell you ideas. Some of you ladies like to watch the Hallmark Channel. These Hallmark movies, oh, Brother Howell, don't talk about Hallmark movies. Let me talk about them for a minute here, okay? Sometimes those movies have wicked themes. Why does it seem like in some of those, if we can call them chick flicks, can we, for a moment? And I, Pastor Ryan, categorically refuse to watch them, all right, based on principle that I still have a man card. And, uh, <laughs> but why is it sometimes in that movie, this lady's married to this guy who's just a jerk, Right? And next door is a guy without a job. That's why he's home all day. Great with flowers. And always has like long hair, long flowing blonde hair. And his name's, his name's like Aiden or something like that. No normal name known to man, of course not. The guy who's a jerk has a great job. He's usually like on Wall Street making uh, seven figures a year. Drives a BMW, which I love BMWs, all right. And what do you find yourself doing in this movie? You're not careful. You're finding yourself cheering for them for the, for the nice guy next door. Because the guy who she's married to is such a jerk. And you're praying, or not praying, but you're cheering this marriage to, on to break apart. That's wicked. Is it not? And if we're not careful, we'll just let those ideas infiltrate our minds. All right, we'll let that wickedness come in. And, and, and I see the Lord, he observes what's going on down here. It grieves him at his heart because everything going on was wicked. I wonder if he showed up to the United States tonight and he observed the U.S. Would he say, everything going on is wicked? I would hope, as Jesus said, that we'd be salt and light, that we'd be a city set on a hill. I'd like to think that he'd come to Saginaw and he'd say, you know what, Saginaw is bad, but there's a place where something's going on there. God saw the earth and it was wicked there. It was corrupt, it was perverted. And we can say that the earth is probably similar that way now. But I see probably my favorite, my favorite thing in this passage. Verse number eight, look there please, verse number eight. The Bible says, but Noah. I see God's man, but Noah. Next week I'm going to preach on Jonah, the good Lord willing. And in Jonah chapter 1, you're going to see this word, these words twice, but Jonah, but Jonah. And God commanded Jonah to do something, and the Bible says, but Jonah did something else. I look here in this passage and I see, but Noah. I see a few things. I see a welcome contrast I see a contrast to the wickedness around. I see someone standing for the Lord while everyone else is walking for the world. And God looks down and he sees this wicked world. He sees all these things, but he sees a man and a family standing in righteousness. He sees someone, and can I say this? God is always looking for servants who will follow and obey him. Second Chronicles tells me this, For the eyes of the Lord run true and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. See, God's always looking for those who will follow him and turn toward him and obey him. And I see Noah, God's man. He was a welcome contrast. He was a walking testimony. The Bible says uh, that he was just and perfect. Verse number nine, he was a just man and perfect and that he walked with God. You see, his heart was turned toward God. He had a relationship with God. One of my prayers for this church is that we will have men and women who walk with God. I don't mean just talk about God. We can all talk about God, but, but walk with God. Well, how do you walk with God? One, you read about it in the Word. 
You come to church like you are, but then you begin to listen to the voice of God in your life. You say, well, what does that sound like? Sounds a couple different ways. Sometimes it sounds like scripture. Thou shalt not steal. So should you steal or not? Help me. No, no, that's, 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 you'll try it again. Should you steal or not? No. no, okay. Walking with God means doing what he says. Love your neighbor. You mean the guy who's a jerk? You mean the guy who irritates me? The guy that I want to punch in the throat? The guy that just has it out for me? That guy? No, 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 not, not that guy. Because that's love your enemy. Oh, I do got to love him. Yeah, you got to love him too. And pray for him. You kidding me? That's walking with God, doing what he says. Sometimes it's really clear. It's really clear. Well, Pastor Howell, you know what? Here I am, and, and I'm a lady, and I'm trying to please the Lord, and my husband, he, he's unsaved. What do I do? Well, Peter tells us in Peter. He says, by the, your life, you can convert him. You can show him Jesus Christ by how you live. That's walking with God, doing what he says. Well, should I be kind to my wife? No, 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 no. That's not in there anywhere. Of course it is. Should I raise my children in the nurture and admission of the Lord? Yes, I should. Should I irritate my kids? Well, the Bible says, provoke not your children to wrath. You see, walking with God, first of all, is listening to him, and listening to him is following the Bible. There's many things the Bible spells out very, very, very clearly. In fact, most things in life are spelled out pretty clearly. Should I go on vacation and skip church or be in church? Ah, be in church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. Say, oh, okay, I, I figured it out. I can get this. I walk with God. So to walk with God and listen to him is one, to follow his word. In order to follow it, I have to know it. And if I don't spend time in it, I won't know it. If you look at your life or my life and most of your time is spent in ungodly music around ungodly people and ungodly television shows, you won't walk with God. You won't know what he wants, what, what, what he wants from you. It'll take some dedication in the morning or at night or during the day to look at God's word and say, God, show me the path. He, show me, show me what you want. And not only is it his word, but his Holy Spirit, which bears witness inside of us. He'll also help direct you. Now, this is Baptists can get a little bit crazy sometimes. There's a whole movement called the Charismatics out there. And they sometimes go a little bit over the edge. They'll speak in tongues still. Some of them will look for a second anointing of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes as Baptists, we get these, these weird ideas as well. We want to wrap what we do around the Lord. And so we face, say things like, well, I think God told me to pull over and go to Long John Silver. Someone told me that once. I was driving down the road and God told me to go eat lunch there. Now, it could be. Can God do that, yes or no? Could it could be your stomach? Could it be that as well? So I have to learn to listen and, and figure out what's the Holy Spirit. The problem is sometimes my heart and the Holy Spirit will sound the same. That doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit. I went on a mission trip after, in, in my first year of college. Went to the Puerto Rico, Mexico, and Dominican Republic. I came back and I was burdened. I would have gone in a second to be a missionary there. But God didn't want me to. God wanted me to go back to college. And though my heart was saying, do this, I had to figure out, okay, God, you've got something else planned and figure out what the Holy Spirit wanted. Now listen, and catch this, don't miss this. God is more concerned about showing you what he wants than you are. God wants you to know. He's not trying to trick you. And so Noah walked with God. He was just and perfect, but he walked with God. He said, God, show me what you want today. Lord, show me how to live today. Lord, I'm going to work today. I got this guy who doesn't like me. Lord, help me to be a good testimony to him today. Noah walked with God. The minute Noah knew something, he did it. He was just. He was perfect. And we need some men, we need some women who will walk with God. We need some Christians at First Baptist Church. And, and I want to be known as a church that walks with God, where if God leads us, we take that next step. If God shows us, we do it. His decisions showed he walked with God. And think about this. His choices saved his family. Because Noah walked with God, he saved his whole family. Listen, dads, the choices you make can save your family. The choices you make as a dad can save your family. That is a Bible truth. 
And dads, we have a responsibility to live for God and walk with God. And you be the dad that walks with God. Even when the rest of the world doesn't. When no one else does, you walk with God. You say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Be strong. Listen, moms, you can save your family. You can save your family, moms. I've known families where the dad didn't walk with God. And the kids go on to serve the Lord, be a preacher, be a missionary. You know who saved that family? Mom did. She walked with God. Mom did. She's the one that kept that thing together. Moms, you can save your families. I know of people, though, who were saved not by a mom or dad, but by a grandma who prayed for them. The grandma saved the family. And grandma prayed for me, they'll say, 10, 12, 15 years. Remember, grandma prayed that she'd have a preacher. You see, but I also know in the Bible, the kid can save the family. Think of Joseph. Joseph saved his whole family because he walked with God. You see, it just takes one to walk with God, and the effects are innumerable. We need men and women, boys and girls, grandparents, grandmothers, moms, dads, sons, daughters, who will walk with God. And I see one last thing this morning. It's in verse number 13. First phrase says this, and God said unto Noah. You see, not only was he a welcome contrast and a walking testimony, he was a willing confidant. Noah found out something that no one else knew. No one else in the world knew that the world, the earth was going to be destroyed except for Noah. God said to Noah, I'm going to destroy this whole earth. I want you to build me an ark. No one knew something no one else knew. Psalm 25, verse 14, I found this verse, and it's amazing. It says, the secret of the Lord, means the counsel of the Lord, is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. No one knew something that no one else knew. As, as a Christian, as a child of God, you know things that no one else knows. You find out things from God's word, and this book is such a cool, it's such a cool book. You find out things that no one else knows that God shows us. And God says to Noah, Noah, I'm going to destroy this world. And no one else knew that. It was unusual, but it was unquestioning. Because I find this last verse about Noah, not only was he a walking testimony and willing confident, but he was one who obeyed. In verse 22, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded, so did he. Tonight, I'm going to look at God's mercy and God's message to us. This morning, I want us to think about these three things. One, that God is always watching. Both good and evil, God's always watching. That God cares, but that God needs some men and women who will follow him. As I studied this passage, I wondered in my mind, I sometimes ask myself these questions. What if there had been two men that had caught God's attention? What if there had been three families Five families. Would God have spared the earth? If there had been ten families or ten men, there was just one. There was just one. The only one in the whole earth who found grace in the eyes of the Lord was Noah. And I don't want God to look down on earth again and say, I can't find anybody. Because they were still religious during this time frame. He called the sons of men or, and the daughter, daughters of men the sons of God. There was still religion going on, but there was not people that were dedicated to God. They're not people who were different. I hope and pray that if God were to look down today, he would see some people who were different. He would see some dads who were different, some moms who were different, some kids who were different. And God is always looking for those who will follow him. Noah wasn't swayed by influences. He was swayed by a Savior. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the flood. 
Lord, we can see that even in a time of wrath, we see your grief. But Lord, I'm thankful for the man that followed you, for Noah. And Lord, help us to be like Noah. I wonder if you're here this morning and say, Brother Howell, as you're speaking, God, touch me. I need to renew my walk with God. If God were to look down today, I don't know that he would say, but, but me, like he did about Noah. Brother Howell, as you spoke, Lord, touch my heart, I need to do business with God this morning. Would you pray for me this morning that I'll do business with God with upraised hand? Say, God, touch me. I want to be that person. I need to be that mom, that dad, that young man, that young lady. Amen.